I think it's interesting today, um, from, from my account, we have six first-time visitors here that I can see, seven first-time visitors here that I can see, and uh, this is probably um, one of the more different sermons that I have ever preached in uh, 27 years of being a pastor or whatever it is. And so I thought it was very interesting, uh, that, that fact in and of itself, but I truly believe as we continue to go through the Word of God and we preach every verse in order as it comes up that God knows exactly what He's doing, that His sovereignty rules, and that God brings exactly who He wanted to bring here today. And so I give you that, not apologetically, because I'm not going to apologize for preaching the Word of God or, or Christian morality, uh, but just to give you kind of a disclaimer that today's sermon might be a little bit different than what you're used to. Um, I hope that you will find it as biblical and expository in nature as always, um, but we're going to talk about some stuff that might make some people uncomfortable, and, and I recognize that. I want you to also recognize that I, that I understand that not everybody comes from the same place, that not everybody has the same trauma, that not everybody has the same background. And I want you to understand right up front today that not only on the back of my outline are, are a list of a multitude of resources, but those resources uh, encompass the entire family. Now, on top of those resources, we have other resources as well, and, and if this is something of a, a trigger to you or brings up something in your past, I want you to know that, that we are committed as a church of Jesus Christ to stand with you and help you to move forward just as Jesus would help every single person he came in contact with whether it was the tax collector or the woman or the Pharisee or the guy in the tree, Jesus was always about helping people move forward. And that is what we are committing to do today uh, while preaching the word of God. And so we're going to dive into it today. If you have your Bible, I would ask that you would open it to Romans chapter 13, starting in verse 1. Now, Romans 13, 1 through 7 is where we're going today. And, and this is a an interesting passage. It's, it's a passage I've never preached before. It's a passage I've alluded to in the past in our relationship with, um, with the government. Uh, but, but I found it more than coincidental that today would be the day we would get to Romans chapter 13. Um, God's got some kind of sense of humor. Uh, that's all I can say. So, so as we go, um, Romans chapter 13, verse 1. <clears throat> Let everyone submit to the governing authorities, since there is no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist are instituted by God. So then, the one who resists the authority is opposing God's command, and those who oppose it will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Do you want to be unafraid of the authority? Do what is good, and you will have its approval. For it is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid because it does not carry the sword for no reason. For it is God's servant, an avenger that brings wrath on the one who does wrong. Therefore, you must submit not only because of wrath, but because of your conscience. And for this reason, you pay taxes, since the authorities are God's servants, continually attending to these tasks. Pay your obligations to everyone, taxes to those you owe taxes, tolls to those you owe tolls, respect to those you owe respect, and honor to those you owe honor. Let's pray. Lord, as we open up this passage, I pray for nothing short of your very best today, that every word be yours, that every word heard be from your spirit, and that we would stand firmly on the word of God and not be ashamed of what we believe. Father, help us to look past our barriers, to look past the current events of the day, and to see that the ultimate goal is that you are glorified in everything you have established. May it be so today. Amen. So the first point today is that we are to submit to the government as God's servant. Now, <clears throat> in some parts of the country, those are fighting words. And, and I get that. 
and you are going to have to have a little fun here today because it gets real heavy. So um, you're going to have to laugh along with my corny jokes. So, <clears throat> and so we start off this morning and we remember a couple of things from the last few weeks. First off, this passage is a continuation of what we've done in chapter 12, right? Chapter 12, verse 2. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, right? So that we may know the perfect will of God, right? The perfect, pleasing will of God. And so if we're going to know the will of God, then we need to accomplish the will of God. We need to live like he wants us to live. Um, and, and in order to do that, it's going to impact every single aspect of our lives. How we interact with church, how we interact with our families, how we interact with outsiders. Last week, we talked about God's command to love every single person. Every single person has value. In fact, that was two of my points last week. Every single person has value. And so I want you to remember that because this continuation does not change from the passage of what it means to live your Christianity. Our Christianity should not be confined to these walls, to our families, to our homes, and to our workplaces. Our Christianity should be lived in every aspect of our lives, and that includes in the public square. And so <clears throat> we saw last week that we are to leave vengeance to the Lord, that we are to do good, that everyone is valuable. This week we see that our relationship with the world and the, tall, the call to do good is required for everything under the control of God. And I'll give you a hint, that's everything. He's in control. And so over the last several years, as we even talk about the government and church, I got to tell you that we have polarized as a people. Many say that we should have nothing to do with anything when it comes to the government, when it comes to policy, when it comes to uh, morality, when it comes to anything, when it comes to the nation or its beliefs or its actions, that we should just totally stay out of it. Others have gone absolutely the opposite way, and they're actually calling people out by name, condemning and cursing people, and endorsing candidates from the pulpit. I don't see either one of those in Scripture. My stand has not changed. We are going to continue to preach the entire word of God and we're going to address things that are spiritual in nature as they come up. Things like the institution of marriage, the identity of people in Christ, our need for a savior to save us from our sins and the value of others no matter what they believe, where they come from, what language they speak, which includes those that cannot speak for themselves. And so to start with then, we submit to the governing authorities because God has given them his authority to do what they're supposed to do. And we've seen this all along. Before there was ever a nation of Israel, God established both civil responsibilities and corporate or civil, or, or uh, I'm sorry, personal responsibilities and corporate or civil responsibilities to protect justice, to protect order to make sure that everyone was treated fairly and everyone has value. If you remember, pre-Old Testament law, pre-Moses, the, the concept of the, the lex talionis, the, the eye for an eye, the tooth for a tooth, the Hammurabi's code was, was really the standard of the day. Hammurabi's code says um, that uh, if Stan and I both do the same thing for a living, we have equal kind of status, then we can do no harm to each other. Um, but if uh, Bob was there and Tony was there and they were of lesser statue, well, we could basically do anything we wanted to them. You know, it was, uh, it was fair treatment among people that were your equals. The Bible shows everybody is an equal. Jesus valued everybody that he came in contact with. And you can see that over and over and over as you see the scriptures. And so there, there are ideals then, and as we look at verse 3, their task, the task of the government is to promote good and punish evil conduct. The government therefore does not function independently of God, but instead should answer to God as it carries forth his will in the world. 1 Timothy 2, 1 through 4 gives us a pretty good idea of this. First of all, then, I urge that petitions, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving be made for everyone. Notice that? 
maybe we would do well if we spent more time praying for our leadership than cursing them. For kings and all those who are authority, so that we may lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godly, godliness and dignity. This is good and pleases God our Savior. And listen to this. Who wants everyone to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. The government has a role in God's plan to redeem mankind. To save everyone. That is his will. So do we believe that the church then should run the government? Somebody say no. No, we don't. Uh, do we believe that the government should run the church? No. No, we don't. But we do believe that the government should do right by the almighty God that has given, him, given it a task, a responsibility, and its authority. So secondly... If that is where it comes from, then, then we see our second point here, to obey the Lord's authority. Verse 2 shares with us the second reason that we should submit to the government's authority. If we oppose it, we are not opposing our local leaders. We are opposing God's authority. For God has given us, given them their authority. Now, I don't want to linger here but I do want to recognize that this is important. Every authority that has been appointed has been appointed by God. And it doesn't matter whether you like them or not. You know that, right? Was this written in a world of nice people? He was under Nero when he wrote this. Now, Nero, like I said last week, hadn't gone on his tirade and started slaughtering everybody yet. But it was still Nero, right? God knew exactly what was going on. He knew exactly what he was doing. When he said that they should submit to the authorities, he knew who was the emperor, who was the king. God appointed David, and God raised up Pharaoh. No individual nor any nation is truly independent from the sovereignty of God. Even the devil only has the authority that has been given to him by God. Luke 4, 6, the devil said to him, I will give you their splendor and all its authority because it has been given over to me and I can give it to anyone I want. The government is established by God. It answers to God and is to be submitted to by Christians as God's appointed authority. And so if we're going to do right by God, we're going to do right by the people he has put in authority over us. Now, are there some limitations? Uh, don't get ahead of me. Okay, hold on. Third, we submit to not face wrath. Now, if you look at verses 3 through 5, you get, us, get this understanding um, that pushes us to realize that the responsibility of government goes beyond just having authority. They are not to be a terror to those who do good, but instead to those that do evil. The word here is the word that we get phobia in, from, like arachnophobia. And so when it talks about them being a terror, it's using the word like scared to death. It means fear, and it often refers to us or refers to God. But in this context, and then later on in the context, it's used in, in reference to them and the authority that has been granted to them. And so in these verses, specifically in verses 4 and 5, talk about the government being God's adventure, uh, avenger and bringing wrath. All right, I'm going to say it. This is in reference to capital punishment. That's exactly what it is. They do not carry the sword for nothing. And whether it's a sword or something else, the sword is figurative. <clears throat> the government, like it had in the Old Testament, the ability to execute judgment. <laughs> now, in Old Testament law, before the very first king of Israel, God established over 30 capital crimes. 30 things that you could be killed for. And not could be, should be. Okay, now it's interesting if you go through that list, and I, I had never looked up the list before, but this week I spent a little bit of time, and, and there were some like you would expect, like, uh, like murder. But there were other things like witchcraft and blasphemy. 
But to just shake it up a little bit and do one that maybe you're not as familiar with, I've got another one for you. Exodus 21, 16. Whoever kidnaps a person must be put to death, whether he sells him or the person is found in his possession. So if the standard is clear and someone has done wrong, can we carry out judgment as individuals? No. Now, this is important. This is super important that we understand that we have not been given the authority to go around killing people. It's really important. God has established an authority of that. Think about the woman caught in adultery and how Jesus responds to her after all of them gather up and the mob desires to have him uh, call for her execution, to her to be stoned. John 8, 11, 10 and 11, when Jesus stood up, he said to her, woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, Lord, she answered. Neither do I condemn you, Jesus said. Go, and from now on, do not sin anymore. Under the Old Testament law, she absolutely could have been tried and convicted along with her partner. Individually, though, Jesus shows us what, the way that we should treat other people. The way that we should treat those caught in sin. We should love them and lead them to life. Yes, he always told people where they were at. But he always gave them an opportunity for hope, forgiveness, life. And I believe that that's exactly where we are today. God wants us to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. <laughs> All right, you ready for the second point? I don't know why I asked, because I'm going to do it anyway. All right, we need to fulfill our civic duties, our civic responsibilities. Verses 6 and 7 follow the same pattern that Jesus taught his disciples. <clears throat> Even though he didn't belong to the world, and, and you see in verses 6 and 7, it's about paying your taxes and honor and respect and all of that, right? Even though Jesus would say he did not belong to this world, and his citizenship was in heaven instead of in Rome, Jesus paid his taxes. He, he did what he was supposed to do, and he honored and respected those he was to honor and respect. If you remember, this too was an area in which they tested Jesus in order to trap him. Luke 20, through 25, is it lawful for us to pay taxes to Caesar or not? But detecting their craftiness, he, Jesus, said to them, Show me a denarius, and wh whose image and inscription does it have? Caesar's, they said. Well then, he told them, give to Caesar the thing, things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God. God's. Not too long ago, a famous Christian speaker refused to pay his taxes. He was given a multitude of, of opportunities to make that right and to pay up and own up and change his ways. He, he decided that he would take a stand and that as a kingdom of heaven, uh, that he would not pay his taxes, uh, nor would he pay employment taxes for his employees. And so he ended up with a very interesting prison ministry. <laughs> <clears throat> But it isn't just taxes, is it? When it comes to honor, obligations, respect, and honor, um, this hits to the very heart of our culture. This is a culture that demands, this culture demands that you never let somebody take advantage of you. In fact, the zealots believed that not only should you not pay taxes, but because Rome was an occupying enemy force, that it was perfectly legitimate and respectable to just stab somebody in the back in an alley if you ever got the opportunity to do so. Jesus gives us a different standard when dealing with the lost, when dealing with the government. Matthew 5, 41, and if anyone forces you with you to go one mile, and if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him too. This is re referring to the Roman military practice of impressment. Im impressment. Uh, they could have you, they could impress you to 
come with them and to carry their stuff for a mile, and then they'd get somebody else to carry it for a mile, and then they'd get somebody else to carry it for a mile. It was a way for the, the Roman military to stay very mobile without exhausting themselves so that they could carry out the responsibilities of a soldier. Instead of getting even, Jesus would tell them to do more than what is asked. Along with turning the other cheek and giving them your cloak, Jesus would say that if, if they ask of you to go one mile, go with them too. Some people believe that that actually, uh, and in some of the Western texts, actually give the indication that instead of going with them one mile, go with them two more miles. In other words, three miles. Either way, submit to them as God's servants. And as a final note, those who serve, including our law enforcement friends, should be honored as instruments of God to bring about good. Okay, you got that right? That is the goal. All right, so where's the balance come? Our third point, submit does not equal obey. So all of this assumes that the government is doing the right thing. So what if it isn't? Now, this, this, that statement in and of itself makes me nervous. I've actually seen at least one pastor call for the violent overthrow of the government. By the way, if that's what you're thinking, don't, don't post it on my Facebook page. I'm turning you in. Now, I'm serious, though. What if... It doesn't all work out the way that we thought. Is there a difference between submission and obedience? Somebody tell me. Yes or no? There, there is a difference between submission and obedience. For example, my wife submits to the position that God has given me as head of my household, but that does not mean that she was without her own need to do right by God or that she must tolerate any sinful mistreatment of her. Peter helps us understand the balance between us and the government and God and the government in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 17. Honor everyone. Love the brothers and sisters. Fear God. Honor the emperor. The difference of the words is significant. Just as we would be told by Jesus himself in Matthew 10, 28, don't fear those who kill the body but are not able to kill the soul. Rather, fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. So if that is the case, then what if the two collide? What if we are called to submit to an order or submit to a concept that goes directly against the word of God? And I am not talking about some sort of gray area here. I am not talking about deciding that you don't want to pay your taxes, even though the Bible says to pay your taxes because you think you found some kind of loophole. I, I'm not talking uh, about any of those things that are peripheral things. I'm talking about what if God clearly tells us to do something and the government says that we can't or vice versa. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Bow to the idol. Worship no other gods. Daniel, pray to no other god but me. What if that happens? Then what do we do? Well, we're going to see in the very beginning of the ministry, in the very beginning of, of the church, this was already happening. In Acts chapter 5, verses 20, 28 and 29, the disciples are doing exactly what God told them to do. They're going and they're sharing the news, right? Go and make disciples in all, of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded was Jesus' marching orders. In Acts chapter 5, verse 28, didn't we strictly order you not to teach in this name? The, 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 the rulers, the religious rulers would ask them. Look, you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and are determined to make us guilty for this man's blood. Peter and the apostles replied, we must obey God rather than people. So here's the deal. Not only did they disobey, but they were willing to suffer the consequences for their disobedience. I think that is so important. 
it is so important for us to, to recognize that there is no cost, like the song that we just sang, there is no cost too great to following Jesus. And that if that means that I have to obey God rather than man, that I am willing to pay that cost to follow my God because only he is who I should be fearful of. Well, how about another example? God instituted marriage. The, the communal standard of marriage, our governmental standard of marriage has been expanded to the point that it goes way beyond the Bible to include that which God says is wrong and evil. Now, I still officiate weddings under the authority that God has given me as a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ and licensed by the state of Arizona to do so, but I limit the, the weddings that I officiate to those that are in line with God's word and according to what he has revealed to me. Now, if the day comes that the government says, you will either do this other kind of wedding or, or we will take your tax-exempt status, our church leadership and even in our church documents, we are willing to pay the price to do what God has called us to do rather than to change our beliefs to accommodate someone else. We have to be willing to take that kind of stand. We have to be willing to pay the price. We have to be willing to have something that does not change or, or we are just tossed by the wind, by the waves, right? Always going back and forth by whatever is popular of that day. Now, I want to illustrate this again with something that, that is very specific in our culture, something that isn't always comfortable, but something that is very important. This year, our, our state is facing an, a proposition, Prop 139. Now, I think in my ministry, I think there's been two times that I have spoken about a proposition from the pulpit. And this is going to be one of those times. It is a constitutional amendment to... to, uh, to unrestrict abortion access and to make, a, make it a constitutional right to have an abortion in Arizona. In doing so, that will strip away all rights of the unborn. It will strip away all parental rights and parental input and parental notification because constitutional right means that it is a fundamental right and therefore, you cannot interfere. It means that any input that the father of that child would have had now is totally negated because it is a constitutional right. And for him to even tell her not to get it is a violation of her constitutional rights under the state of Arizona. It takes away the protection of the child. It takes away the protection of the woman in the fact that... that Physician care is no longer necessary, but anybody that has a medical license becomes a potential abortionist. It takes away informed decision. It takes away waiting period. It takes away any of the opportunities for virtually any of the pro-life groups to function in the state of Arizona. And even though our state already allows abortion at 15 weeks and further along in situations where the mother's life is in danger... This is being proposed in what I can only believe is a satanic attack against God's special creation. God's word speaks que clearly on the foundation and the value of life. Genesis 9, 5, and 6. And I will require a penalty for your lifeblood. I will require it from any animal and from any human. If anyone murders a fellow human, I will require the person's life. Whoever sheds human blood by human uh, by humans, his blood will be shed for God made humans in his image. Now, some will say, yeah, but that's not referring to the unborn. But I'm going to tell you that in Exodus 21, 22, uh, it is expanded to make sure that we understand that there is value in the womb. When men get in a fight and hit a pregnant woman so that her children are born prematurely, but there is no injury, the one who hit her must be fined for the woman's, as a husband, woman's husband demands of him, and he must pay according to judicial assessment. If there is in injury, then you must give life for life. That's the same standard as murder. Eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burn for burn, bruise for bruise, wound for wound. I'm going to go ahead and say this. A woman only has one heartbeat. 
A pregnant woman has two. A woman only has one set of DNA. A woman has the God-given right to care for her body and responsibility. I agree with that. But that second body is not hers. It belongs to God, for God is the giver of life, and only God is the authorized taker of life. In Romans 12, we learned that we must detest evil. Just because we're speaking about the civil realm does not take away our responsibility to detest evil and to cling to what is good. The Christians, while they did not protest the emperor, the Christians did not support the widespread evil of the Roman Empire, and we must not support it in any form now. Under this proposed law, Mary, the mother of Jesus, facing hardship, being a single mom, uh, being somebody who was under great duress, under, under the immaculate conception, could have aborted him, could have killed him, till the day he was born. Because that is a threat to the mother under this law. Jesus is not only our Lord and Savior, he is a valuable, he was valuable at conception. He was making a difference from the womb. Luke 1, 39 through 41, in those days, Mary set out and, and hurried to a town in the hill country of Judea, or Judah, I'm sorry, where she entered Zechariah's house and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped inside her, and Elizabeth was, was filled with the Holy Spirit. Masses of cells don't jump, and the Holy Spirit only indwells people. Babies that aren't born still matter to God. So listen, we as Christians cannot let this simply be a political issue. In fact, we fail greatly if we allow this to simply be a political issue and not a moral and ethical and biblical issue. If we submit to the government as the ultimate authority, then the wise men would have told the king would have told King Herod where to find Jesus. Any good citizen submitting to the authority of Rome would have helped them track down baby Jesus to slaughter him as they fled to Egypt. If we fail to detest e evil, we will be follow we will uh, follow. Um, I'm sorry, if we fail to detest evil, we would have followed the rule of Pharaoh and we would have helped him kill the babies as they were born during the time of Moses. But there is another choice. Look at Exodus 1, 15 through 17 and then verse 20 and 21. The king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, the first whose name was uh, Sephara and the second whose name was Pua, when you help the Hebrew women give birth, Observe them as they deliver. If the child is a son, kill him. But if it's a daughter, she may live. The midwives, however, feared God and did not do as the king of Egypt had told them. They let the boys live. So God was good to the midwives and the people multiplied and became very numerous. Since the midwives feared God, he gave them families. They were directly disobeying the government to save the life of an innocent. Amen to that. And I'm going to tell you, if anybody understood the consequence of their action, they understood the consequence. They were willing to pay the price to do what was right, to value those babies. Now, let me be very clear. This is not the only issue in the world. The unborn are not the only people that we care for. But this truth is not about how we feel about a political party or a candidate, about anything other than the value that God has placed on his special creations. We must detest evil and reject the continued satanic attack upon the family and the value of life in our nation. There should be no reason that any Christian would have trouble seeing that this proposition is not of God. And I'm going to just go ahead and say that it's evil. If you're not sure, not only have I given you a set of scriptures to look at, but I've got flyers that break down the proposition all the way down on top of what I've put at the back, the three back points here today that you can pick up about it specifically um, that, that will absolutely clearly help you understand that not only is this a, a terrible 
proposition, but it is unnecessary. So here's how it balances for me. And, and I think it is important that we understand that there is a balance. I will submit to the government, and that means that I won't commit an act of violence against those who disagree, against an abortion clinic, or against the government itself. But I will fear God. I will obey his word, and I will do my, heart, my part to help the authorities that God has given to follow the Lord and his values as they seek to uh, execute justice and uphold the law. We must give Caesar only what is due to Caesar. And that is our submission, but not our fear. Not our obedience. Submission, not obedience. And so today I'm asking you to live your faith. To live your faith and to live like we fear God and God alone. Let's trust in the Lord. Cling to what is good. Live out what is right so that he will bless us too. And let's be good citizens, praying for our leaders in the hopes that others too will be saved. Let's pray. Father, as we come before you now, I'm, I'm asking that you help us to look beyond all of our hang-ups, all of our filters, all of our stuff to just see that this is an issue that we can all agree upon. Everyone matters. You are the giver of life and we cannot take your place nor support any part of it. Help us, Father to do what is right, to live our faith, to be respectful citizens, and to honor the authorities over us. In Jesus' name, amen.